At Making Medicine, we're reporting on the headlines, not making medical recommendations. For personal health questions, always consult a doctor. Nothing in this episode constitutes investment, financial, or legal advice, and please consult your own advisors before making decisions. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Medicine podcast, where science, policy, and innovation meet. As always, I'm your host, John Stanford. This week, we're covering a leadership shakeup at the FDA, fresh regulatory moves on biosimilars and gene editing, the sudden shutdown of Arena Bioworks, a new manufacturing talent hub taking shape in Virginia, and we'll visit the rumor mill about an upcoming White House drug pricing announcement and possible other administration actions. So lots to cover. With that, let's get into the show. Our first headline today is a leadership shakeup at the Food and Drug Administration. The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Director, CEDARS Director, George Tidmarsh, abruptly resigned after being placed on leave amid an HHS review and a lawsuit alleging misconduct. Director Tidmarsh had reportedly raised concerns about the legality of the commissioner's national priority voucher concept that we've talked about on previous episodes and the broader FDA direction under the new administration. He says he's being retaliated against and plans to contest the exit. We won't weigh into the legal battle that's coming from this, but instead wanted to focus on the broader impact of these changes at FDA. This leadership shakeup, this isn't the first, follows the saga from Vinay Prasad where he left and came back and comes at a challenging time for FDA navigating a shutdown. And there are reported concerns over slowdowns and reviews, missed PDUFA dates, and the shutdown possibly exacerbating the issue. October, for example, logged only two novel drug approvals out of the agency. That's down from five in September and ties for this year's low. In 2024, four drugs came out in October and six in 2023. Moving past the reasons for Tidmarsh's departure and contest and lawsuit, and even looking past Vinay Prasad's departure and return, the broader question is, is FDA giving investors and biotechs clear certainty for them to move forward with their products? Three things that we're watching. Predictability risk, where industry can depend on standard timelines. This is critically important because every day that gets added to a PDUFA date actually represents tens of thousands of dollars. It's forcing small biotechs to go back and possibly fundraise more in an environment that's incredibly challenging. This is impacting the ability for people to plan. You're timing these pivotal milestones years in advance It's guidance given not just to the investor community, but to patients and to scientists. It all runs smoothly when the FDA is running smoothly. And lastly, all these changes make engaging with the FDA really challenging. We were talking just last week with some biotech executives who, through no fault of the FDAs, were dealing with entirely new people in the review of one of their applications. And they said it was really starting back at square one when they were so close to the finish line. Now, No one wants to see the FDA speeding ahead without prioritizing safety and efficacy. But these leadership transitions are yet another cautionary tale that might have people scared to move further in biotech because they're not certain how the regulatory agency will respond to their needs. But credit has to be given to the FDA that they're also making moves on other fronts to possibly speed up the development of new medicines and create broader access and affordability. The FDA recently moved on two fronts that do provide more clarity and investor support, in this case for biosimilars and gene editing. We mentioned on last week's episode, while we were recording, the FDA and HHS more broadly were releasing new draft guidance that aims to speed the development and lower costs for biosimilars, proposing fewer comparative clinical efficacy studies when robust analytics can already establish biosimilarity. This is something that on its surface last week, we, along with a number of other folks, wanted to hear how they could be confident in the idea that a biosimilar works as well as its underlying biologic. Drawing parallels to generics and small molecules from a scientific perspective isn't always appropriate. The FDA announcement got into greater detail here that we're happy to share. The FDA says it's utilizing evidence from 76 prior biosimilar approvals over the last decade. They're using that information to say that streamlining won't compromise safety or effectiveness. Biosimilar developers spend tens of millions of dollars 
and as long as a decade conducting clinical trials to prove that their version is just as safe and effective as the original. FDA Commissioner Marty Makari shared at the announcement that he expects this new guidance to have the timeline and cut down on cost. Biosimilars could be and should be a crucial way to lower drug prices. So this is possibly a welcome move that can aid in efforts that importantly doesn't weaken patent protections that drive the novel innovations to begin with. It's great to see the FDA and more broadly the conversation of how we bring lower cost biosimilars to market. Developing a biosimilar has been described to some as effectively developing a whole new drug based on the guidance they have. So we will see how the FDA moves forward on this biosimilar guidance and the impacts it has in potentially bringing market-based competition to drive down cost and increase affordability. The FDA also announced progress on gene editing. On the advanced therapy side, Vinay Prasad signaled that the FDA will soon publish a paper outlining a faster, quote, extremely flexible path for personalized gene editing therapies. That follows the FDA release of three new draft guidance documents aimed at streamlining the development, approval, and post-market monitoring of cell and gene therapies. Those documents focused on facilitating clinical trials in small populations, expedited pathways for serious conditions, and strengthening post-approval data collection. Together, the announcements, along with the upcoming paper, signal that the FDA is committed to accelerating safe and effective advancements for cell and gene therapies a welcome acknowledgement considering the recent pullback from cell and gene therapies across the industry that we've covered in recent episodes. So what do we make of all of this? Well, the FDA, despite leadership transitions and some concerns that they don't have the people in place to review drug applications, are moving forward with commitments to explore new regulatory pathways for two critical areas. We all know that the biosimilar marketplace has not developed the way it needs to, to bring down costs similar to generics to small molecules. So this could be a welcome change as long as scientists concur that the safety and efficacy are still there. Cell and gene therapies have had a troubling time. We have not developed the policies, reimbursement, and regulatory frameworks to let these be successful and garner more investment. We've chronicled company after company, large and small, stepping away from this space. And so it is good to see that the FDA is serious about making sure we don't lose ground to cell and gene therapies. As we covered in last week's episode, that is a particular place where China is investing more. We will change to some unfortunate news coming out of industry this week, and that's the shutting down of Arena Bioworks, the research institute that debuted in January 2024 with $500 million for a decade of R&D. They announced this week that they're winding down There were numerous investors and philanthropists excited about ARENA's capability to fund basic research and continuously spin out new startups to fund ongoing research. With the shutdown announcement, roughly 50 staff, including co-founder Stuart Schreiber and CEO Harvey Berger, are being let go. It will stop conducting research and hand off its discoveries to the scientists to advance it independently. Why the abrupt stop, especially from something that was so promising only a year ago? Well, the press release quote in our mind says it all. Since the conception of Arena Bioworks, biotech macro conditions have changed dramatically and the rate of change is accelerating with no clear turning point amid policy uncertainty and weak funding. The challenging markets are nothing new. We've been talking about that for the last five years, waiting for the biotech rebound to begin. But what stood out to us was the call out of policy uncertainty driving Arena's decision to close. This has to be maybe the 10th, 12th, or even 50th canary in the coal mine saying that Washington is not giving this industry the confidence to invest, whether you're a large manufacturer or a small biotech. Co-founder Stuart Schreiber said, in retrospect, I would say that if you want to test the new model, you should do so in a period of time when venture investing is at least on a level playing field with the other options that investors have. This is potentially a case study in timing. Private capital titans, even well-connected institutes with marquee talent will struggle. But it underscores a bigger point for U.S. leadership in biotech. Philanthropy and billionaires can catalyze, but they're not a substitute for durable public sector science funding and a policy environment that attracts follow-on private sector investment. We'll reiterate what we've often said on this podcast and to Capitol Hill, 
and to the administration. The NIH funding is critical to establishing basic science, but predictable paths that unlock capital will need clear signals from policymakers to underwrite the risk they're taking. All of these conversations about price controls are an anathema to that investment. And so it's actually with very little surprise that we see innovative ideas like Arena Bioworks not succeeding. One of the other concerns, besides challenging capital markets and unclear policy, is workforce. And can the U.S. truly build a workforce that can deliver on next generation medical innovation? Well, some promising news, or at least an announcement of it, came out of Virginia with a public-private partnership between AstraZeneca, Eli Lilly, and Merck to stand up the Virginia Center for Advanced Pharmaceutical Manufacturing. As the announcement noted, this center will be the nation's largest multi-company, industry-led hub for drug substance manufacturing and related operations, strengthening U.S. supply chain resilience and building a world-class GMP-ready workforce through collaboration among industry, academia, and government. Each of the companies are contributing about $40 million, alongside the state and higher ed partners creating a scalable training hub, about 90,000 square feet. This talent center doesn't exist in a vacuum. Billions have been announced for new facilities in Virginia. Lilly is planning a $5 billion plant near Richmond. Merck broke ground on a $3 billion expansion in Elkton. So it's going to be critically important for the $500 billion in manufacturing investment that we have heard about as part of the Trump administration's push to onshore more, the biomanufacturing bottleneck will be people, not buildings. So it's great to see a public-private model that pairs colleges and universities. North Carolina, as a state, has proved that this can work, and Virginia's using that playbook. So hopefully, in the years to come, as these buildings do get erected and the factories are turned on, They'll be the people, talented chemists, and manufacturing workforce enabled to make these manufacturing sites functional. It's an interesting dichotomy that we just come off the announcement that Arena Bioworks can't make it work, and yet there are significant manufacturing investments in brick and mortar sites that are onshoring. They're two very different things. And again, policy is at the center. The Trump administration has made clear through policy and announcements that they want to see more U.S.-based pharmaceutical manufacturing. The market's responding. Companies are making announcements, and now we have workforce initiatives. But at the same time, the administration and Congress over the last several years have not sent a signal that they're interested in the actual innovation and drug development to happen here in the United States. And that's where the market's responding as well. And that's why, in the very same episode, you can hear about Arena Bioworks closing while more workforce and manufacturing facilities go up. It's critically important that we show not just the interest in onshoring, but that we also show the interest in keeping the innovation here. Finally, we'll visit the rumor mill for our last segment. It wouldn't be another week without another White House announcement, and we're recording this on Wednesday, so we are yet to have all the details of probably the biggest announcement yet, and that's possibly one or two deals coming out tomorrow with major manufacturers. Multiple outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, are reporting that the administration is close to drug pricing agreements with Lilly and Nova Nordisk that would expand Medicare access for weight loss use. Companies aren't confirming the terms, and a White House spokesperson called the chatter speculation while the talks continue. But these are pretty serious reports with a lot of specificity that the lowest dose of their weight loss drugs would be available at $149 per month. That would be a substantial impact to these companies for their most popular drugs. But if Medicare opens the door, even partially, to covering obesity for these drugs, it's a major access shift for a class of drugs now only covered for diabetes, cardiovascular risk, and sleep apnea. The companies may see a significantly larger population for which the drug will be covered, and in exchange, they get to where we think this is somewhere the administration always wanted to go. Only a few episodes ago, we were talking that one possible off-ramp and one big target for the administration is getting a GLP-1 into the approximately $100 to $200 per month range. It sounds like that might be exactly what we're hearing later this week. While less reported on, another rumor that we're paying attention to 
is the idea of demonstration projects coming out of CMMI at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. This is effectively HHS's experimental unit that can play around with policy under the guise of saving money. One idea that we saw in the first Trump administration, but was eventually thrown out for procedural reasons, is effectively a tax on Part B manufacturers. For simplicity's sake, we think of Part B as drugs infused by a doctor, so they often happen to be biologics. We'll have to see the specifics of this policy and if it really does come out. But if this is an announcement, I think it's worth flagging, while people are working on it and before we've seen it, that this would be a mistake. It's another assault on the bottom lines of companies that are already exposed to significant headwinds. At some point, it's just too much. And if we look at Arena Bioworks or any of the other dozens of companies in Incubate's investment life science tracker that have closed or shuttered programs because of price controls and the lack of investment into this space, it would be concerning to see effectively a tax put on one type of manufacturer. We've already seen what the pill penalty did to small molecule manufacturers. So it would be concerning to see similar arbitrary attacks on Part B drugs. This is certainly something we'll probably keep talking about. But while it's there in the rumor mill, and we know that some policymakers listen to the podcast, before you move forward with anything like this, think about what we learned from Arena Bioworks and from others about how challenging the environment is and that they probably can't sustain yet another hit via discretionary tax. At the end of the day, what we've heard about proposals like these are effectively ways to increase revenue at the Treasury Department. This is not something that would impact patients. It is not something that would put dollars back in American patients' pockets, but instead is effectively a tax on a specific type of drug manufacturer. It reminds us a little bit of proposed ideas coming out of the Commerce Department to increase and charge fees related to intellectual property. Yes, these can be revenue raisers, but at what cost? And so as the administration continues to explore more ways to bring in revenue, similar to the tariffs conversation, we hope that everyone can see that these are stacking up and beginning to make not just the early stage environment, but even the late stage manufacturing far more challenging. That challenge will translate to less investment, which, of course, will translate to fewer drugs down the road. So we're hoping to have robust engagement with the administration and Congress on these kinds of ideas and make sure that Incubate's voice and your voice remains heard when it comes to the innovation ecosystem. That's all for this week's episode of the Making Medicine podcast. Have a thought or question about today's topics? Drop a comment and we'll feature it in next week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn, X, and Instagram using the links in the description. Thanks for listening, and as always, keep innovating.